Welcome to the Theology in Motion podcast. Join us for conversations about the theology of worship, its practice, culture, and design. The Theology in Motion podcast is by the Center for Worship Leadership, Christ College, Concordia University, Irvine, in California. Welcome to Theology in Motion. My name is Steve Zank, and on behalf of the Center for Worship Leadership, we're glad that you are here. Today's guest is Dr. David Taylor. He's a director of BREM, Texas, an associate professor of theology and culture at Fuller Seminary. The BREM Center works towards integrating worship, theology, and the arts for the renewal of church and culture. Dr. Taylor is an ordained Anglican priest, and prior to his appointment at Fuller, he served as a pastor for 10 years in Austin, Texas. He was born and raised in Guatemala City, and he's lectured fairly widely on the arts in both academic and pastoral popular settings from Thailand to South Africa. David's most recent book is Open and Unafraid, The Psalms as a Guide to Life. He's also the author of The Theater of God's Glory, Calvin, Creation, and Liturgical Arts. He was the editor of For the Beauty of the Church, Casting a Vision for the Arts, as well as co-editor of Contemporary Art in the Church, A Conversation Between Two Worlds. He serves on the advisory board for Duke's Initiatives in Theology and the Arts, as well as InterVarsity Press's academic series, Studies in Theology and the Arts. Uh, <laughs> we're excited to talk to him about his book today, which is also about the arts. Uh, it's Glimpses of the New Creation, Worship and the Formative Power of the Arts. I think we could say, Dr. Taylor, you're a bit of an artist yourself. In 2016, you produced a short film on the Psalms with Bono and Eugene Peterson uh, on the Psalms. And so uh, it's great to have you here today. Thank you. It's just an honor. Thank you, Steve. That's a very kind introduction. <laughs> and I'll, I'll link uh, the book that we're discussing today in the show notes of the podcast. So I invite you to, after the conversation, if your interest is peaked, go there. And I really recommend the book. So Dr. Taylor, in your book, you help us think about the unique power of different forms of art as they pertain to worship. And maybe as a preamble to that conversation, I'd like to ask, what is it about us humans that we relate to the arts? Mm. Um, You know, I think one of the, you could say it's conviction, you could say it's simply a presupposition of the book, is that in the same way that originally, say, uh, at at our origin uh, as human beings, God was interested in our whole humanity that's not that god enjoyed one part of our humanity but and the other was you know take it or leave it it was our whole humanity so in jesus christ and by the power of the spirit god remains interested in our whole humanity interested in healing it forming it transforming it redeeming it reconciling it in all those good words and then in the end you know perfecting completing glorifying our humanity and what the arts do, I suggest, certainly in the book, uh, you know, the whole book is about this, is the, uh, the arts, in one way or another, bring us into an intentional and intensive experience of what I call the aesthetic mm-hmm. aspect of our humanity, by which I mean the sensory aspect of our humanity, you know, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. Uh, our affective or emotional aspect of our humanity, uh, the imaginative faculty. And then this isn't so much a faculty of of what it means to be human. I would simply say that it is a way that humans negotiate the world through metaphor. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and there are philosophers that write about this, how human life is fundamentally metaphorically oriented. Uh, You know, we feel up today or we feel down today because lightness travels up and heaviness travels down. Yeah. Uh, Time is money and costly and all these metaphors that help us negotiate the world. The arts are, are uh, as, as the science fiction uh, writer Ray Bradbury once said, the, the, uh, the breakfast of champions uh, metaphors, Uh, I'm sorry, the metaphors (laughs) are uh, the breakfast of champions for artists. And so every work of art, in a sense, uh, is a kind of metaphor. Um, 
you know, if, if you think about sadness, for example, and you listen to Verdi's Requiem, you, you might say to yourself, or you might not, but you might say to yourself, gosh, that's exactly how I feel. Uh, but you could also listen to Sufjan Stevens or Adele, and, and it's a very different musical composition, and they write a lot of sad music. And you say, oh, no, that is how I feel. Mm. Now, obviously, it's a combination of music and poetry, right, and the performance, like how they're sounding it out in their own you know, distinctive ways. So it's not that they're saying, not that Verdi or Adele or Sufjan are saying, this is precisely, literally what sadness is. But they're saying this is sadness in a manner of speaking. Like I'm giving, I'm naming sadness. I, I'm expressing, interpreting, but also perhaps enabling you to resonate and say, yeah. oh, I think you've made sense of reality. All that to say that the arts are bringing us into this concentrated experience of this aesthetic dimension of our humanity, which just so happens to be something that God so loves. Yeah. Yeah, and I I want to uh, really appreciate the way that you approach it in your book because I think you're also remind us this that that this metaphoric nature of the aesthetic world, mm. uh -huh. this, it's not as if like now if you're a listener and thinking, well, I'm not that artsy, you know, I'm not that right. artistic. Sure, it's almost like you are reminding us uh, that uh, even when you imagine Jesus as a shepherd. Right. You're engaging in the artistic world. It's not like, well, Absolutely. I'm just using language or something. It's, sure. Um, and you can find this argument historically with Martin Luther and Karlstadt, you know, Karlstadt who would argue uh, against images, the kind of class controversy. Sure. Let's take all the images out, right. you know? Right, and right, Luther's right, right. like, no, no, as soon as I mention Jesus on the cross, you're making images right. in your mind. Exactly. So that's kind of what we're getting at then, right? This idea that yes. as we engage the arts as humans— it's kind of like it's not just a part of theology or something. It's kind of the whole enchilada. It's it's the it is it's everything that's going on around us. And so, I'd like to ask about kind of that we t get into this. The I'm really excited to talk about the singular powers that you identify sure. with different kinds uh -huh. of art. You root these powers in what you call uh, determinative patterns of worship, so mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. arts in worship ought to be freed. Here's a quote from your book: "The arts in worship." ought to be freed to form the church in their own ways, but not on their own terms. As you say, mm -hmm. liturgical arts serve worship and not mm -hmm. the other way around. Yes. So um, why is that important to you as you get into the arts? What's the relationship between the power of art and kind of rooting it in these patterns of worship? Sure. Uh, do you mind if I just uh, add one little comment no, to please. kind of your yeah. imagined listener who's oh. saying I'm not artistic? I, like, I totally get that, right? Yeah. Um, and I guess maybe what I want to say as a word of encouragement is uh, that there are these two fundamental aspects of reality of, that, that God has created. One is creation and the other is culture. Mm. That is, creation is like this raw data God's own artistic, you know, works. And then culture is taking the raw data as it were, and humans making something of it right there. Genesis one and two business, right? And it, it, it is something we do because God designed us. Like it, it delights God to see us do this kind of work because mm -hmm. that's what it means to bear the image. So to my listener that says, gosh, I'm not really artistic. I say, I, I understand what you're saying. And, and I want to affirm sort of that sense of I'm an engineer, I'm a farmer, I'm a this or that. It's like, that's good. God has called you to those things. You don't have to be an artist to appreciate the arts, but look around your room or look around your house, look around your city. Everything is marked by an artistic mm. uh, activity, right? My shirt, my glasses, my phone, the covers of a book. The music I listen to, my bed sheets, <laughs> my china, yeah. you know, everything has its artistic. And I, I guess what I want to say is, it's just the, the warp and woof of, of the kind of world that God made possible. And I think what I'm doing here is only focusing on one context, which is our you know, corporate worship context, yeah. which is a very restricted, um, high stakes kind of context. So I just at least want to sort of say... There's like art in all of life and all human history and all this kind of things. And I, I'm interested in those, but this book is really focused on this one context, yeah. which is why Carl Sartre and Luther and others, you know, go at it, you know, with such passion <laughs> because the stakes are really, really yeah. high. 
Yeah. So that just like just a little preface to affirm that listeners say, yeah. I'm on your side, and then I'm inviting inviting you to you know maybe discover uh, uh, other possibilities. Yeah. Uh, you know, as it relates to the arts and worship. To answer your actual question to me, I think I'm trying to navigate between the two extremes that would say um, art should be allowed to do whatever it wants in our, you know, worship liturgical gathering on the one hand, uh, irrespective of what it is that we're trying to do, pray, preach, sing, confess, so on and so forth. And on the other hand, sort of this, the other extreme would be um, that the art should not be, uh, to put it in the terms of my book, so not be, music should not be allowed to be musical and story should not allowed to be story and poetry should not allowed to be, uh, you know, poetry. Um, but it somehow should be m- made um, less than, <laughs> mm. less gloriously than, um, than it, it intended to be. And the real purpose of worship is for us to get stuff done. Stuff in your head. We get stuff in your head. We get stuff in your heart. We hopefully get stuff that changes how we, you know, love our neighbors and do service and mission. And the arts are just, there may be a convenient way to do that more efficiently. Hmm. Right. And again, to go back to your shepherd, you know, um, uh, example, I guess what I'm trying to say maybe in my chapter on poetry uh, is to point out, I think, an important fact that a third of the Bible is poetry and the Holy Spirit, as the author of Scripture, designed it that way. Um, Because there are certain things that we can only know about God through poetry, Hmm. not around or despite poetry. So that's the other extreme. Like, well, let's just get around the poetry and get to the real business of things. And I guess I'm simply saying, that's actually not the Bible that was given to us. <laughs> yeah. uh, we were given a Bible that kind of has all the arts at work because God wants it to be that way, because yeah. there's this rich constellation of ways of knowing and communicating and being in the world that the arts are able to name or make possible. Yeah. That is. So to your Lord as a shepherd, it's not that it's, it's not that God or Jesus, let's just talk about Jesus. It's not that what Jesus really wanted to say was, I can take care of you. If Jesus had wanted to say, I can take care of you, he would have said, I can take care of you. Yeah. Right. Or I can protect you or I can provide for you. He could have said that he is the second person of the Trinity. After all, he has access to zillions of ways of communicating. But he says, the Lord, I am your shepherd because the shepherd is this metaphor that contains within itself a whole host of associations of meaning, right? Yahweh is a shepherd. uh, It's a society that, you know, uh, includes the the profession of shepherds because that's a primary commercial economic means of, you know, making a living and providing food. Uh, The social class, you know, sort of associated with shepherds. Um, The the fact that in ancient Near Eastern societies, um, sometimes, you know, uh, emperors or, or kings were were described as shepherds, but in a way that was domineering of, of yeah. human. But now we have a shepherd who does not domineer, right? It kind of her- harkens oh, back to, to, to Ezekiel in the th- 30s somewhere. There's a whole thing yes. played out where where the, the shepherds of Israel, the kings of Israel, card shepherds, they do a horrible job. Yes. And Ezekiel, it's like, I'm going to be your shepherd now. Yahweh's... So like, yes. even, that, even that image... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So all these things, like in, in that one metaphor, a whole host of meanings are, are communicated and make sense to the original hearers. They go, oh, yes. And they can hear kind of popping up in their heads and hearts all these ideas or feelings or imaginations. And now Jesus is embodying it in, in, in a unique way. And so that's the idea, you know, of this metaphor or this maybe yeah. poetic way of speaking. So the extremes are, let's let art do whatever it wants, which has happened recurrently in threat history and still today. On the other hand, the arts are this maybe, you know, necessary thing, but not really uh, uh, welcomed, celebrated. It's just something we do to get to the business 
we sing in order to get to the business of saying stuff. Right. So I'm yeah. trying to avoid those extremes yeah. and say, let's let music be music and poetry be poetry and, you know, drama and our bodies and so on and so forth, architecture, but discover ways in which a whole sort of range of media of art and styles of art and practices of art can serve the different activities of worship, whatever it may be for your congregation, whether you're Anabaptist, Mennonite, or you're, you know, Lutheran or Eastern Orthodox, can serve them in, in, in unique ways that enhance and enrich yeah. our activities of confessing our sin or confessing our faith, for example. Yeah. And I, I think throughout your book, you demonstrate how liturgical art, and you, as you say, opens up possibilities mm. of formation. Yes. And also yes. closes down other possibilities of formation. Right. And I had a conversation recently uh, on our, our Facebook page with a gentleman who was asking about the uh, uh, positioning of an altar. And he mm. said, hey, uh, you know, is it in our new church, we chose not to have an altar. You know, mm. what do you guys think about that? And I actually, right. qu I, qu I quoted you and pointed him to your <laughs> book. And I said, well, what's interesting about the altar conversation is, you can go a lot of different ways. You know, you have to have an altar or it's a, you know, you shouldn't have an altar because the meetings are too, you know, whatever it is. But right. I think the, at the foundation, what you say is so important to say, let's just at least say, if mm. you have an altar that opens sure. up certain possibilities of formation and closes down other possibilities. Yeah, and if exactly. you don't have one, the same thing's true. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, the, the power of formation yes. in, in this conversation? Sure. So one of the examples that I talk about in the book is how Gothic Cathedral, a Gothic cathedral, opens up and closes down. And I, I'll compare it to, say, worship that happens, let's just go to an extreme, into a, in a living room, yeah. which is not unusual in church history, you know, under conditions of, <laughs> yeah. of persecution or duress. That may be the only thing. Certainly, you know, the early church era yeah. is predominantly the meeting in homes because that's the only place that you could safely meet. Um, and so, it, it, um, when we gather to worship in a space, who is it that's gathered? Well, human beings. Well, what kind of human beings are these? Well, we're Christians. Well, how does the New Testament describe this collection of humans that are now somehow defined by this unique, decisive relationship with Jesus? Yeah. Okay. Well, the New Testament says, well, you're, you're like a body. You're like a temple. You're like a people. You're like a nation. You're like a family. You're <laughs> all these metaphors, metaphors, right? Back to yeah. metaphors, because there's no one that can say it all. Uh, architecture um, can tend to make certain of these New Testament metaphors more generative. They resonate more in a space. So if we say that the people, the, the Christians gather together, this community is like a pilgrim people and they're on pilgrimage and they're headed to the promised land and the, you know, the cloud by day and the, and the, the fire by night and the host of heaven, you know, are, mm -hmm. are cheering them on and the light of God is shining upon them. And it's an upward ascent, you know, which really like in the patristic and medieval era was kind of a dominant way of viewing ears who are going up, 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 up. Right. Uh, well, Gothic Cathedral is sort of this, you know, uh, maximal version of a building that does that really, really well. Mm -hmm. So you're seated in pews or chairs, you're side by side, as if you were marching side by side. You come in from the, you know, the outer spaces, the profanus, the outside the temple space. You come, maybe, you know, there's a basin of the baptism to remind you of what it means to enter in, go down the nave. And then there's this table, altar, and then you have the vision of the eschaton, the end mm -hmm. of all things, right? Mm -hmm. And it's big and it's open and it's tall and it's light and there's you know, a sense of airy and expansive and majestic and maybe there is this, um, you know, a mosaic or, or stained glass window of Christ the King. It does pilgrim people on the way, you know, to the to the promised eschaton with Christ the King ruling over them really well. Mm -hmm. It struggles. That space struggles to act 
activate the metaphor of family because you're separated out. When you sing congregationally, your voices are ricocheting all over the space. So it's hard to have a sense of like what it means to be intimately or domestically together. Mm-hmm. So conversely, a living room does that really well. Right? <laughs> your bodies are really close, yeah. kind of looking at all each other. It's probably a very relaxed space. There's maybe a table that you'll gather around to have a meal right after, right? So you're worshiping, and so you got the love feast, celebration of the Lord's Supper happening, you know, in a common space. And does that really well, but it struggles to do the royalty, majesty, expansiveness of the yeah. church architecture. If you occupy that space, either space, your entire lifetime, it's going to engender in you a sense of what it means to be a Christian. And if I never have an opportunity to turn my body, to to turn myself or to experience myself in, say, familial, domestic, kin and kith, kinship type relationships, I may never actually relate to you in and out of that rich metaphor of a family. Mm -hmm. And, And conversely, right? So that, that's, I, I guess, one of the examples that I give that a Gothic cathedral opens up um, the possibility for certain metaphors for what it means to be this community it, to really shimmer and, you know, shake, as it were, and others don't, right? Other spaces. So no space is neutral. Uh, and, and so then it begs the question, which I ask my students, how would you go about mitigating mm-hmm. the losses, right? Are there things that can be done? So just real quickly, when I talk about visual art and combination to the narrative arts, because most instances of the arts and worship are like multimedia. Yeah. You know, it's never one thing by itself. But at Duke Chapel, uh, at Duke Divinity uh, Duke University, where I got my PhD, and I visited and I worship there often, because it's just beautiful, you know, gothic kind of space. The stained glass windows tell one story. They tell one story of church history. They tell one story of scripture because there are only so many figures that are represented. You can't put everybody up and you can't, you can't take them up and take them down. They're there forever. The skin tone of most of these figures is light. Over time, a person who worships there may get the idea that people with lighter skin tones are somehow have a privileged access Mm. to God or to like the central, the central role that they place in, in defining what it means to be the church. So what Duke Chapel has done is to um, introduce alternative, supplementary, complementary, or even countercultural st- stories by occasional art that they hang alongside the walls just outside the nave. And it's not so much, um, you know, waging war against the stained glass windows, Maybe that's needed in some cases. It's mainly it's opening up and enriching the story that can be told. That is the body that one holy Catholic apostolic global church includes, you know, people from every tribe, tongue, nation. So how can we tell those stories through occasional exhibits that go up for a season of the church calendar and come down and others come up? So they're in conversation. Right. So that's like one way to mitigate the loss of only one narrative being told through this medium of stained glass windows is you have other stories that are being told so that if I come and I'm an Afro-American or Latino or whatever it is I may be, I look on the wall and I see, oh, wow, there's somebody that looks like me that represents me. We're in this together. I have an active role to play. So those those are the kind of things I try to explore in the book, and I'll just say this to end it, I very consciously wrote the book without the intention to necessarily persuade people to agree with me about what art should and should be done. I have convictions, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I do have some things that I hope to persuade readers, but mainly to say whoever you may be, Lutheran of one kind or another, you know, high Lutheran, low Lutheran, <laughs> This is just like a diagnostic to help you have a sense of like, how are we being formed? Like, how are we being formed in the trying life? How are we being conformed to the life of Jesus? How are we being conformed or transformed in our lives together through the arts that we use? I don't need you to become a completely different thing. 
but perhaps to discover riches that are in your own tradition, yeah. you know, or in your own liturgical theological ecology that you could mine, draw out in order to be more deeply formed. So I'll end there. Well, it's, it's beautiful. One thing that comes to my mind as you think about that is it, sometimes we tend to think that our theology alone does all the shaping or something. But the truth mm. is, you take the same theology of the Lord's Supper and mm. enact it in that Gothic cathedral, right. and then take the exact same theology of the Lord's Supper yeah. and enact it in that living room, right. and you actually have two distinct theologies of the Lord's Supper. Absolutely. Um, which is such an interesting way to think about and then how do we mitigate these things? Because right. the power of the, the metaphor that the scripture provides in the Lord's Supper, for example, mm. through the bread, through the wine, the different mm. different ways of... Uh, and I, and just to, to clarify for my own tradition, uh, I don't say because there's metaphors that Christ isn't really present as, okay. a, as a Lutheran, okay, but in my own stance on this. <laughs> but that doesn't mean there's not metaphors working, you know, and, and meaning I'm working. Sure. Yeah. As you think about art's distinctive power or unique power or singular power, mm. you say that um, if you imagine uh, Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem on the, on the donkey and they say, you know, hey, if, if these people were to stop praising me, uh, the rocks would cry out. And you tell us these rocks would cry out in distinctively stony ways. <laughs> yes. And I thought, what an interesting way to get us into this understanding of that. Uh, different kinds of, of art or different ways of, of working aesthetically have mm -hmm. distinct power, distinct mm -hmm. ways of influencing us. Mm -hmm. And um, you do uh, through several different artistic methods in the book, but probably the listener, one of the methods the listener is probably really interested in is music, because a lot mm -hmm. of our listeners are, are practitioners in music. What do you identify as um, music's singular power? Uh, mm -hmm. And and how does that play into how we think about the role of music in worship? Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a musician listening to this, or a musicologist, or a music theorist, I'm not going to say anything you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I am, in one sense, a generalist. I always have been my whole life, but I try to be uh, faithful, uh, honest to those of you who are practitioners and, and theorists of one sort or another. And so one of the things that I say about the singular powers of music amongst many of its singular powers is that it is a time-based medium. It works through time, mm -hmm. whereas say in contrast, sculpture works in fixed time. And so with visual art, 2D, 3D, I, I, one of the singular powers I identify for it is its material fixity. It's, mm -hmm. it's in one space. If I look at you, say you're a sculptor, I look at you, Steve, and I see you. But if I turn away, I can't see you. I can't experience yeah. you. But if you talk to me or you sing a song to me, I could look anywhere I wish. I could walk anywhere in this room and I would experience oh. you, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. it, in real time. And so if I sing the doxology uh, halfway through, it, it would not fulfill its purpose. It would not um, generate its most potent power upon me, right? It's moving through time. It's moving up. It's moving down. It's moving into a resolution. Yeah. And as most people, not most, let's say, as many congregations sing it, it, it invariably slows down as you get to the <laughs> end of it which personally drives me crazy, just sing the thing in one tempo and be done with it. Not because I don't care about it, but it, it just, it does make me chuckle every time that it's like, it's just, we just slow down. But, but even though it's like a little bit of a, you know, odd pet peeve of mine, I understand why we slow down because what we're trying to do is we're, we're entering into this intensive savoring mm. of this resolution of what it is, you know, that we are, you know, declaring in our song together. And um, so, uh, music. Uh, let's just take John 17. Jesus says, I pray that you would be one as the Father and I are one. Mm -hmm. The great prayer of Jesus. And then the rest of the New Testament <laughs> is trying to figure out how we actually fulfill that prayer yeah. of unity. Yeah. 
And as I write about it at the beginning of my chapter on the musical arts, Christians have struggled and have been in, in what I call intense fellowship with one another about what musical medium, media, styles, practices best fulfill or, or yeah, the job of helping us to be one. So Gregorian chant, unison, right? So for mm, first nine centuries of the church, that was the dominant way in which, you know, people sing together yeah. uh, musically, right? And there were explicit arguments made. This is how we are truly, deeply, fully together. Mm-hmm. Sing note all together. Nobody is singing a different note, right? Because it is argued that puts us into places that are at odds or separated from one another. Mm. Palestrina comes along and says, well, maybe there's some other ways that we could be unified musically. <laughs> and um, I think a few select human beings have the power to pull it off vocally. And we will represent for the people, the lay people, what it means to be a unified body. Yeah. So the lay people have no role to play, hmm. but it, they're being sung on, on their behalf, in their stead, and that's how we are together. Bach's cantatas come along and say, well, okay, that's a little bit too extreme, so let's just figure out some concerted performances that could take place. You know, you don't have to be like the most elite vocalist to pull this <laughs> off. You have to be somewhat skilled. And you have these gorgeous, you know, compositions. But then some of your, you know, folks in Geneva are saying, Phew, I'm not sure, you know, we should include that many instruments. So let's just sing the Psalms in metrical style. And uh, that's how we will be mm-hmm. together. And up in England, they have their own ideas. And let's do SATB. And, you know, we'll do Sacred Heart, for example, and you stand here, we'll be in the square and we'll sing at one another. And then African-Americans come along and say, whoo wee, there's some more possibilities. Let's sing in improvisational, syncopated and dialogical fashion. And that's how we'll be maximally <laughs> together. Yeah. Right. So all this say we're all aspiring to the same goal, mm-hmm. unity. But the music is sending us in different directions and forming us in very, very different ways, right? So if I sing in these improvisational, syncopated, dialogical, I absolutely need to be able to see you. Like I cannot be side by side because we're talking Mm -hmm. to one another in the holes. It may be like Sacred Heart. You have to be able to see one another's faces. Other musical practices don't require that as much. Then another example, which I talk about in the book, I I contrast Hillsong's Ocean with uh, In Christ Alone. And I say, you know, one of the things that they have in common is they're highlighting this idea that God is in the business of rescuing Mm -hmm. us. But whereas in Hillsong's song, there's like this marriage between St. Peter being rescued and St. John the Beloved. So it's a marriage of these two images in scripture And in Christ alone, it's St. Peter being rescued with St. Paul. And in Christ alone, drawing out of this reformed, evangelical, Irish ballad tradition that is very story-driven, a simple musical-ish arrangement that lots of different kinds of humans could sing together. And you're marching through a very dense field of ideas because that's what it means to fully acclaim and experience this idea that God is in the business of rescue. So you're marching through the, what they call the whole country of salvation, the whole gospel story. And it's not the whole gospel story, <clears throat> um, but it is presented, you know, as the whole gospel story. Yeah. Because one of the reformed sort of evangelical priorities is this faithful, reasoned confession of who God is. And that's great. And the New Testament says, amen. But the New Testament also says there are other ways in which we faithfully encounter God. So the Pentecostal charismatic tradition on the other side is saying, man, one of the most important priorities, we see this in the Psalms, we see this in Song of Solomon, we see this bits and pieces in the Gospel of John, maybe in the book of Revelation, is this affective encounter, this this experience of the adoration of God. Really drawing on the Catholic mystic tradition, this contemplate, this leisurely Mm -hmm. contemplation 
of God. And in order to have that experience, we need seven and a half minutes right. to do that. Right. Because you can't be leisurely uh, with God if your music is clip, you know, rushing you along at a clip, right? So the music is recursive. And you're going in and out, you're swelling in and out of this big sound, little sound, big sound, little sound. All that to say, music <clears throat> is, is these two musical ex- examples, I guess, are sending us in different directions, though they still are aspiring to the exact same goal. So they're forming us, opening up and closing down possibilities. Yeah. So, you know, whatever it is that, you know, a person's conviction is about what music should and should do in, in, you know, in our corporate gathered, you know, setting, I would simply say, um, uh, what does it look like to invite your people into uh, a greater fullness and richness? And you don't have to even go outside of your basic, you know, musical idiom. But if you look at your musical idiom historically or transculturally, you know, how it is that Lutherans around the world, you know, in different contextual cultural settings are being faithfully Lutheran, right? Which I think that would be the goal. Um, then are there some other things that we could, you know, incorporate uh, graciously, carefully, thoughtfully in order to bring us into this rich testimony that the New Testament offers to us? And I don't mean just New Testament. Obviously, the Old Testament is playing a determinative role in our worship practices. But I guess for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to talk about the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I love the emphasis on uh, the unity of the church through singing that some folks are trying to really trying to achieve that. And it made me think a lot about our, uh, our song choices that we make. And I came across a quote by Paul Hindus, Hindemith, who wrote, people who make music together cannot be enemies, at least while the music lasts. And I think about all the the tragedy of the worship wars in some way, sense. Right. We fought right. over music, right? Uh, still do in some some ways. And um, But it's at the same time a, a powerful testament and even a accomplisher of the unity which we seek. Sure. Sure. And, you know, the other thing I think about what you're saying is uh, sometimes you can't just take a Hillsong Oceans and <laughs> truncate it and expect to accomplish the same things because the content right. and the, the presentation, the aesthetic presentation, right? the content is partially in the aesthetic presentation Absolutely. and not just in the, the words. And in right. fact, one person could perfor- even perform in a certain right. way. Right. Uh, at the same length, and it'd be an entirely right. different experience. Absolutely. And so, that, you know, I think this r- helps remind us all that we, as we plan and execute worship, um, curate worship, that mm-hmm. it's it's these these aesthetic choices actually are really important, and right. the aesthetic choices themselves, not just the song selection or the the right. the liturgy flow, but the aesthetic choices along the way have really an important impact. I, I have a question I want to get to just because it's something I'm very curious about what mm-hmm. what you think about this. Um, it, in the study of metaphor, talking about mm-hmm. symbols, um, it's pointed out, as you said earlier in this conversation, that there's a way in which uh, metaphor is irreducible. That, that is, mm-hmm. if you mess with the metaphor, like you said, <laughs> if you said, uh, when Jesus said that he's my shepherd, we can just reduce that to he cares for me. Right, but right, that right, doesn't right. work. That is not how it works. But also, you mentioned in your book that there's a, a way in which metaphor also carries a surplus mm. of meaning. And I've been really mm. trying to understand that myself. So this is a kind of selfish question, but I think our listeners yeah. will also learn from it. Right. Um, right. Nicholas Wolterstorff writes the idea that in worship, there's always variant participation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, peop- that we intend the experience of worship to be a certain thing, mm-hmm. and s- the people in the congregation individuals, mm-hmm. my experience would be a very different thing. thing. Like well, for yeah. one classic example is the modern song, um, Reckless Love. Yes. It, like some folks think it's wonderful and that God is right. God is chasing after them, even though it's right. not wise in the ways of the world. Other right. folks are saying, God's not a reckless driver. And all of a sudden <laughs> we have a very, extremely variant participation from the right. same metaphor. Right. So based upon your study and thinking about these issues, uh, what do we what do we do with this sense of variant participation that are latent in metaphors? Is there something we can do to help form the congregation, or are we you know how do we just even start thinking through sure. that dilemma? Oh gosh, I mean, probably the simplest but most unsatisfying answer is to say that meaning is always contextual. Yeah. Um, 
which is an uninteresting answer, but it is true. <laughs> and let's just say like, you know, reckless love arises out of, I'll put it in this terms, a liturgical and theological and ecclesial culture where there's a good chance that they have already been talking uh, about God's love in this way for years, yeah. for decades, yeah. in a way that for them is the most quote unquote normal thing in the world. Of course, God has this, um, you know, um, prodigal father yeah. aspect. Yeah. Um, and it's a resonant image in the Pentecostal tradition, historically, like it's, it's, it's a, if you go back to the origins, the beginnings of the Pentecostal tradition, it is appealing to many people on the margins, lower socioeconomic classes, um, and, and populations um, where, let's say, alcoholism or marital infidelity or uh, other kinds of abuses, say, or addictions are wrecking families and communities. And so for people to experience uh, the power of God miraculously, you know, that once was lost, like yeah. really lost, prodigal yeah. son lost, and God, like a father, chased after me. Yeah. Now, that's, that's part of the genetic code of Pentecostal history. So you get to reckless love uh, and... Uh, to understand how it works in the context, you have to understand the backstory. Yeah. Now, today you have, you know, radio and TV and internet, not TV, <laughs> radio and internet that can transmit, you know, reckless love to many different other contexts. I, I was in a church, uh, I won't name it, but a number of years ago, it was uh, a liturgical tradition. I'm just going to say that. And most of the folks in the congregation were older, let's say 50s, 60s, 70s. The worship music leader was younger, came from California, Southern California, uh, out of kind of a non-denom CCM radio kind of world. And he played a lot of these top 10, top 20 songs. Mm -hmm. But he, 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 he really struggled to figure out how to help these actual people enter into it fully. Yeah. And what invariably happened is these people just watched because they, they couldn't figure out how to even sing the song, the music. It was, it was too all over the place for them. It wasn't part of their tradition. And so it was, it was this chasm, right? There he's leading with a band, hoping that anybody out there might be joining in. But his context is one galaxy and their context is another galaxy, mm -hmm. an alternate reality. And so, you know, he's got... <laughs> He's got one variant participation. They have another, you know, yeah. it's like Loki from, you know, the Marvel <laughs> yeah. series. It's variants out yeah, there. That's right. In very different <laughs> history. Um, I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, except again, what may sound like a simple answer, which is you never stop educating. Mm -hmm. You never stop inviting. You never stop refreshing or pushing refresh, you know, on your browser, on your liturgical browser. You never stop doing the work of helping people enter into full, you know, active conscious worship, especially if you're introducing something that may be new, mm -hmm. you know, in some capacity, new musically, new lyrically or otherwise. So unless you're tilling the liturgical ground, the liturgical culture, a new medium of art will simply be experienced as this utterly foreign yeah. and therefore utterly unmeaningful yeah. and therefore uh, minimally transformative or non-transformative thing. Yeah. That's one answer. A, a second answer would be to say like, I, I'm in an Anglican context. Um, I'm not a parish priest. I, I'm what I call a DH priest. I am a designated hitter priest. I help out <laughs> sure. my congregation. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and our church is like, let's say if, if a 10 is Anglo Catholic, so just, as high up as you can get. And then the one is as low churchy as you can get. I would say we're like a six or seven mm -hmm. on the liturgical calendar. And we have people that come to our church who are cradle Catholics, that then converted to one form of Protestantism or another. 
And we have people from Southern Baptist or Presbyterian backgrounds. And they have variant experiences or participations of the liturgy, yeah. right? And for some, they bring certain instincts that are going to cause them, let's say a cradle Catholic may have a positive or a very negative response to all the bowing and vesting. Yeah, and, you know, sure. Incensing and all that kind of business. And my Presbyterian or Southern Baptist, you know, folks may come very anxious. <laughs> Is this voodoo? Is it hypocrisy? Is it superstition? Is it idolatry? Yeah. All these things, right? Or they come hungry, you know, because they really want this fully orbed, kind of aesthetic, liturgical kind of experience. And I think what the church leaders, you know, our priests, pastors have to do is continuously invite and educate and train and say once a year or several times a year, this is why we do what we do, you know, maybe take a whole service to do kind of an explanation or every Sunday have little moments of like, Hey, when we come to the table, this is why we open our hands. You know, this is why we do these kinds of things. This is why we sing what we sing This is why we see what we see. But invariably, over time, people, if they stick with it long enough, you become formed by the ecological culture of, yeah. you know, it, like there, an inertia is acquired or you get folded into an inertia. So just the last example, I was born and raised in Guatemala. Born and raised in Guatemala is a very, you know, it's a Latino, a Latin culture. It's open, it's expressive, it's relaxed. Very little starts on time, getting late as normal. It's mm-hmm. happy, no problem, mm-hmm. nobody's stressed out. Uh, you talk to somebody on the phone and you do a lot of like, how's it going? It takes a while to get to the business of the day. Yeah. I moved to the States when I was 13. By the time I got to college, I had been reculturated. Mm-hmm an American sort of way of being in the world. And I remember very, very clearly in my early 20s talking to a friend in Guatemala on the phone and finding myself becoming instinctively irritated because I wanted to know what (laughs) he wanted from me. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, man, this is so weird, right? (laughs) That the kind of human I used to be, this would have been wonderful and desirable and welcome just to meander our way to the point. But as an American, I've been reacculturated, right? Yeah. Or reacclimated or rewired. And that's the same thing I think in liturgical cultures that over time there is an inertia that is acquired to use sort of physics language. And then there's an ecological sort of habit, you know, to use biological language. And so the variant participations to really answer the question, I think become um, more minor, as it were, the longer mm-hmm. you stick together as a community, the more you have traffic in and out, I think the variant participations are going to be a higher. And then there's just a lot more risks, not bad risk, but this a lot more like, I have no idea what this will do. Yeah. Positively or negatively. Yeah. It sounds like there's kind of two factors. And I love this image of the tilling, if I can say it, I'm not sure if I'm remembering right, but the idea of tilling the liturgical soil Mm-hmm. In a way, if you stop tilling the soil, the ground will harden. And when you try yes. to incorporate a new thing, it's just right. going to bounce off the surface. Right. But if you have a practice of continually refreshing this idea of, mm. no, no, we do these things because they're important to us. We don't right. let them master us. And actually, we're very open to even including new things that fit within our tradition well. Yeah. And if we continue that process, mm. new things can flourish and, and grow. Mm-hmm. And the other mm-hmm. thing I hear you saying is that when we do that, we have to also be uh, educators. We can't yes. just stick a new thing in the ground and as everyone yeah. walks past, they're like, well, what, what exactly is that? You got to put a little sign and, you know, say, hey, this is this right. kind of tree. We put it here because it's going to do this. And <laughs> uh, of course, maybe you can find a way to do it more artfully and implicitly than <laughs> right. so explicit. But right. that's for me really helpful to think about the liturgical uh, cultivation and, and tilling allows that openness. And the education mm-hmm. allows it to be, uh, you know, because we don't, it's, it's okay that, in other words, I'll say it this way, if we had no variant participation ever whatsoever, then maybe that's also a different kind of problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I know we're getting sh- uh, short on time here together. And there's one last question I'd like to ask you about the, uh, this idea, this context and that, that, not that context. And I love the way that you talk about the Holy Spirit 
and its mm. role in contextualization. Mm. Can you kind of talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit's role in this conversation? And if you want, as it relates to this idea of context. Um, again, I think, you know, but there's only so much I can say about the Holy Spirit in, in a book like this. Mm-hmm. But because I come to the task with a certain Trinitarian conviction, <laughs> I get to figure out what it means, you know, to think about all these things in a Trinitarian way, which is to say, what is the Father doing, Spirit doing, Son doing? Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> again, I, you know, I haven't played guitar my whole life. You know, I have that experience when your guitar string goes out of tune. Sometimes the most efficient way to get it in tune is just to throw it out, you know, throw it really <laughs> off tune and yeah. you bring it. Back. Like if you just sort of, you know, fiddle with it, you're like, wait, is that, is that right? Is that right? No, you just sort of throw it really far off, you know, flatter or, or, um, what is it? Flat or sharp? Uh, what are the two extremes? <laughs> yeah. You, you, you tend to like to, to make it flat and then bring it back up to yeah. where it's going. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I tend to think in terms of extremes. That is, I ask myself, what would what might be the extremes here? Mm-hmm. And on the one hand, you have the extreme that sort of has this idea that um, your work as an artist or your work of welcoming the arts into the life, the worshiping life of the church is indistinguishable from the spirit. So mm-hmm. spirit told me, here it is. Yeah. Uh, whatever it may be. So it's like a collapsing of the spirit into my own human, you know, whatever self. Yeah. Um, and, and on the other hand, sort of this is like, it's the other, it's the utter erasure of the spirit. That is um, our life together is always and ever uninterruptible. Like there's mm-hmm. nothing in, there's nothing, there's no sense in which the spirit remains sovereign, capable of actually refreshing, making new, <laughs> yeah. you know, doing something else. Um. So how can we think about, you know, the, the work and person of the Trinity as it relates to the arts? So, I mean, a, a few things I, I think that I try to commend to the reader. First, you know, these are things we confess in the creed that the spirit is the Lord and giver of life, which is to say the, the, the spirit is the Lord of creation. We see that in Genesis. Yeah. We see that in Psalm 104. The spirit is in the business of making things alive mm-hmm. and reviving things, you know. So the spirit is at work in, in Bach you know, composing a specific work. The spirit is also at work in a Lutheran congregation a hundred years later for whom this say, you know, Bach, him, uh, feels no longer lively. It's not doing anything fresh or new. It's just sort of this, you know, routinized, uh, blah, 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 singing of it. But then the spirit comes and refreshes, you know, Mm re-energizes, gives everybody a, a renewed sense of what's happening when they sing this hymn together. So that's one thing we can say. A second thing that the spirit is the one who inspires and empowers culture making in humans. Yeah. Uh, again, from the very beginning, uh, we see that obviously most obviously in Bezalel and Aholiab in Exodus 31 spirit. It's really like the first you know instance of spirits doing something with humans is upon these artists empowering them to make stuff mm-hmm. uh, for this, you know, t- temple space, but that continues, you know, throughout the, the rest of scripture. Um, I would also say, you know, that the spirit is the one who brings order and delight and pleasure, right? So the, 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 the fruit of, of the garden is good for food. It does stuff utilitarian in, in the best sense, like it helps us subsist. Yeah but it is also has this aesthetic dimension. Like we look at it and it, it excites us. We're drawn to it and it makes us think, Oh gosh, what if I could paint that or <laughs> sing it, you know, or dance it. Um, and so the spirit is one who enables us to take um, fulsome delight without devolving into all the things that get us into trouble as human beings, when we indulge our appetites. Right. On the other hand, the Holy spirit is the one who, enables all things to be rightly ordered um, with each other in in the world, in the cosmos, uh, in the Trinity, you know, theologians would say, uh, in the the church, in Jesus's ministry. Um, But it's important to understand that that the kind of order the Spirit creates uh, isn't isn't factory 
line type or military march mm-hmm. type order only. That is, you know, if we march in step, ba, 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 one, two, one, two. Well, that is one kind of order, right? But physicists will tell you, biologists will tell you, marine biologists will tell you all kinds of ways in which, you know, species on planet Earth are ordered. Yeah. Who is the one that ensures, secures that capacity for species and genuses and whatever else, you know, ecologies to be ordered and tundras and savannas. And it's the spirit, right? And so, so too, in the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the spirit is the one who makes all the individual members uniquely, particularly, fully, gloriously themselves while bringing them into this impossibly miraculous relationship (laughs) of, of, of unity, right, with one another. And you see that as the final vision. So again, the history of, of the, the relationship between art and the church has been marked by exceeding anxiety about all the ways that the arts might malform us. I don't think that anxiety is 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 wrongly placed or, or you know far fetched or yeah. inappropriate, but it is often played a dominant role. That is, anxiety is often played sort of the driving force and yeah. how we think about. It. So what we're doing is we're securing ourselves against this potential threat, you know, of chaos. And what I want to say is if we have a really robust theology of the spirit, we don't actually have to be afraid. We can be cautious, we can be careful, we can be thoughtful, we can be wise. But, you know, again, my African-American brothers and sisters who love R&B or hip hop or soul, whatever you want to call it, and they have this dance party-like experience the truth of the matter is they have often felt judged and found wanting for, mm. by other members of the body who love so-called classical music, right. so-called traditional, yep. high church, you know, fine art, these so-calls, right? And I would say the Spirit is the one who makes possible all things as faithful manifestations of worship, whether they become hybrids, you know, whether we get some cross-pollination or not, depends on the context, Right. But the Holy Spirit is the one that can make us wise and capable of discerning what it would look like, uh, you know, for a congregation to open out to new things, which is that chapter that I write on mother tongues and adjectival tongues. What does it mean for us to remain truly ourselves that God has called us to be as a local congregation while also opening, you know, to the renewing work of the Spirit through, you know, other means or media. So it's not it's not an easy task. But I think what I hope to do in the book is provide like a, a new mythological framework. Like how might we think about the work of the spirit as it relates to the arts so that we can be freed in an unanxious, gracious way to do the work that God has called us to do and experience the fullness of life together and, yeah. and for the sake of the world, you know, that God so loves. Okay. With that, I'll end. <laughs> you provided us a wonderful uh, platform from which to dive into the book further on these <laughs> issues. No, this is great. Let me ask a concluding question that we ask a lot of our guests. Mm. Uh, imagine with me there's a, a road upon which every leader of worship has to drive on their way in to their mm-hmm. places of worship. And we've acquired a billboard on that road, and we're looking for some input. You know, what can we, what can we put? What message can we put mm. on that billboard to encourage those leaders as they go to do their work? Uh, do you have any suggestions for us? What would be, uh, how would you encourage them if you were to put something on that sure. billboard? So, you know, board, billboards are supposed to be pithy. I don't have a pithy one. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe maybe we could uh, liven it up or lighten it up in some way. So he, here's, here's, here's what I would say. It's not billboard worthy. I mean, you know, in the way that billboards normally work. But I think I would put on the billboard as, you know, people are driving in something like, May your experience of the arts today enable you to experience the fullness of God's grace. Mm. Like that, that's really what I, whatever it is, yeah. I really sincerely hope that they enable you to encounter the grace of God in a, a rich, deep, full, fresh way. Because we do live in a world that just, it's hard, you know? It beats us down. We get discouraged a lot. Hard stuff happens, bad stuff. And I think a lot of people come to church weary and, and worn down or confused um, or hardened, whatever it may be. And if the arts, what we sing, what we see, what we do with our bodies, the stories we tell, 
um, you know, all these things, if, if they enable us somehow, some way to experience the, the grace of God afresh and anew, I think that would be a pretty decent outcome. Yeah, I love it. Thank you for this refreshing conversation. Really yeah. enjoyed talking with you. Uh, again, it's been an honor, and uh, thanks for joining us, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for listening to this episode of Theology in Motion with Dr. W. David O. Taylor. If you enjoyed this content or are a regular listener of the show, it would be grateful if you would rate Theology in Motion on iTunes. It only takes a couple of minutes, and your rating will help this content appear more quickly in searches. Thank you. We'll see you next month.